Okay, this is being insane. Hold on a second here. Um, let's see what I have to do to counteract this. Uh, they're doing this weird thing again. Same thing, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I I went live yesterday on this, so it should, you know, everything should work. Um, but um, okay, I'm gonna try this again. Yeah, I had to hit the OK button. That, that, that may have been a problem. What? What? It, uh, it asked me to, to click OK, so I didn't know if that was holding anything up. OK. Yeah, um, whenever you do, whenever you do. It says we're live. <laughs> OK, we're live. Um, OK. Except I, I can't see it. So uh, hopefully it's working properly. Uh, so just one second here. Okay. There we Hi, go. everyone. I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot and very happy to be here today. So I have David Sarita with me and we're going to be going over his new, it's, it's actually part two of the part one that we talked about the eclipse, but now it's going into the hidden planets side of it, as well as other information da David has been heavily researching at this time. So hopefully this is all working. I believe I'm live right now on my YouTube channel, even though it's not telling me that. <laughs> so, uh, so, so welcome, David. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, I see you're live on YouTube. I got a little banner showing up here. So excellent. So that's great. You yeah. know, okay. So, so uh, now I was going to do this bio thing. Let me see if I can actually, uh, I don't know if I can, if this will come up. No. Okay. Um, sorry about this. Okay. They're, they're kind of blocking me here. So uh, I can't read, I wanted to read your bio uh, again, not able to do that right this second. So uh, let's give out the URL that you just gave me, which is David Sarita. Oh, I can I can pull it up, Carrie. Watch. Oh, that'd be great. I can pull it up on my end. So I go here about okay, here we go. Um share screen right there. And that shows um Okay, I have to go to about, uh, the, here we go, the founders. Can you see that? Okay, yes. Um, so let's see, do you want to stop entering?
Okay. So, yeah. Um, okay. Well, well, let's just have you go over this because it, it's quite long. So why don't you give a short cover, cover a short bit of it. And, uh, and, and that way the new people that have just joined us uh, will be able to know some of your background. Yeah. So basically, um, you know, I was born August 21st, 1961, and our family, you know, four boys and my mom and dad moved to Berkeley, California in about 1964 or 65, which is where I grew up, you know, right in the middle of the Vietnam War protests. And my dad was getting a PhD in psychology there. And uh, my mom and him divorced and my mom married a military Texan who was a science teacher. So both of my fathers, because my stepfather, David Cooper, was my father for about seven years. I was a Cooper, actually. <laughs> I was David Cooper. And um, so both of them greatly influenced my my orientation. You know, my real dad towards the development of meditation, the inner mind. I've been meditating every day and doing breath and sound and frequency work for 45 years every single day. And then I, I met my wife in about 2004, or in the end of 2003, Crystal Sarita, you can see here. And, you know, I ended up working for, I, mean, I took physics traditionally in school, a grade 11 and 12 physics. And then I went into doing my own studies and I ended up working for the most legendary physicist in American history on nuclear fusion I worked, you know, and knew closely Bogdan Castle Maglich, who is a Yugoslav-born, former Yugoslav-born, uh, just like Tesla, um, MIT PhD physicist professor who was working in the company of Glenn Seaborg, who is the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. I met Seaborg many times and had conversations about UFOs and everything. I was around Murray Gelman, many, many Nobel Prize winners. So I, I learned a lot about fusion energy directly from the, the core advanced physics corporation. Norman Rostocker was there, a lot of brilliant, brilliant minds. And then I went on to develop my own technologies for altering consciousness, tuning consciousness, and also for therapeutics. And uh, I appeared on Art Bell, George Norrie. I was a regular for both of them for many, many uh, years even over a decade and appeared on, you know, Fox News, Discovery Channel, History Channel, CNN, uh, Anderson Cooper. I've been on most of the major news networks and, of course, your podcast many times, Carrie. And there's just too many radio shows that interviewed me over the years. And Ancient Aliens, I was on the first two seasons or was it one season? I can't remember. Um, so... My my personal, you know, where this is all going in part two here is for me, this is personal because my wife, Crystal, you can see a picture of her here, died on the 9th of August, 2021. And for me, belief isn't good enough. You know, where did she go? And I had this ability that I could actually, I actually had this experience that in Sedona. We lived in Sedona for, from about, 2006 to 2013 or 14. So we um, we we had this quantum entanglement bond that was so great that I could actually hear her when she was out of body dreaming. And I in fact remember one night in Sedona with my eyes open, saw my wife floating back into her body, connecting with the body and rolling over in the bed in that one second. It was like a wave hitting a log. Like, so the wave is the spirit body. The log is the physical body. So I had this ability with her. And when she died, which was a very tragic death, I actually heard her calling out to me in the middle of the night. And I got up at three in the morning and I noticed she was at home. So again, it was after she died. It was the, the first notable time at 243 days after her death. She calls up my name. It's electric. Like it's, it's audible. And I leap out of bed and she telepathically tells me, Mark, you know, look on the calendar. Look at, so I look, it's 243 days, which is a single Venus day. Venus will go around the sun one time every 225 Earth days. 
and it will rotate sunrise to sunset in 243 days. I said, my wife is on Venus. I, for me, it was confirmation of Dante and many other experiencers that the, the planets are not bare on, on the spiritual dimension. They're not empty. Like Pythagoras said, that they are not empty at all. And there, there's whole civilizations that are vibrating at what you would call hyperdimensional um, energy levels that are not necessarily visible to us. And then the great moment was 591 days after her death. She does it again really clear. And she tells me, see, the, the, the audible part is David. She just calls out my name. That's all I hear. But it jolts me out of bed. And then the inaudible part tells me, take the 591 and do the calculation, which I divided by the golden ratio. And uh, I should probably do this one more time for people who are new to really see this, to, when you understand the orbits of the planets. So you take 591 days divided by the legendary golden ratio, is and I do it once, that's the exact, exact accurate to 99.9999% amount of days it takes Earth to go around the sun, and that's accurate to like 13 decimals. I divide it again, and that's Venus accurate to 99%. Because Venus is technically, the way we calculate it, just a shaving under 225 days to go around to go around the sun. Divided by the golden ratio again, I get a planet that we don't know about with an orbit of 139.516 days. Divided by the golden ratio again, and I get Mercury accurate to better than 87%. And I do it two more times, and I get the orbit of planet Vulcan, which was a hypothetical planet because it was actually observed by astronomers, even in the state of Colorado in the end of the 19th century, using very good telescopes. They they knew it was not sunspots, people. I, I've had so many people tell me that it was a sunspot. No, they knew that. <laughs> These guys, they were not stupid. So Vulcan really mystified the astronomy world because they could see it and then they couldn't see it. So the fact that its visibility was not stable turned it into a hypothetical planet. And so when this process started, these insights just kept coming. So it's been just over a year since mm -hmm. my wife called out my name at the 591 day mark. And you can see from our last presentation, which we did about the eclipse, that these three dates, and I'm gonna, this is gonna blow people's minds when I show you this, that these three dates, I'm just gonna recap this before I go to the really deep into the forward, fast forward is, is you go, the first eclipse of August 21st, 2017, the, remember, Amuamua, which is this big, long, cigar-shaped rock, basically enormous rock, was coming in at 33 degrees. So it's crossing the ecliptic. It's not coming in parallel to ecliptic. It's coming in from this steep angle. And I believe astronomers detected it's coming from the, the region of the Pleiades. So Avi Loeb, a Harvard physicist, you know, puts his, his reputation on the line because of its sudden acceleration when it went around the sun was way faster than any other interplanetary or solar system rock. He determined that it was intelligently driven. So Oumuamua gets publicly noted mid-October of 2017. But upper mid um, August during the eclipse, it's it's clearly coming in, and it should have been visible at that time. I could track its exact position, and then last year's eclipse, October fourteen, night um, is 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 a reflection anniversary to what is known as the miracle of the sun at Fatima in nineteen seventeen, and the eclipse of April eighth um, was the date for Easter in 2012, also in 1917, 1928. And that's due to the, the lunar calendar does not work when you compare it and you cross-reference it to a solar calendar, which marks one exact trip 
for Earth around the sun per year. So the question is, how did my wife do this? And you notice this August 21st date, which happens to be my birthday, but it's also the birthday of Jesus in the Arantia book. But I don't think very many people even know what that is. But you're going to see in a minute how why this date is so important in the three dates. Because all of these three dates correspond to something that is utterly inexplicable. But I'll show you in a second here. And th this, is, th this is just mind-blowing. The first thing you have to do before we get into really advanced theories is you have to see how to correct the true date of Christmas and Easter, which I will prove today, April 11th, on the correct calendar is the real Easter. And it should be that way every year for the next 158 years until it will go to April 12th. And that means the crucifixion was the date of the great American eclipse. And this is this is really accurate math. So you can see this. So how to find the true date of Christmas and Easter on our current Gregorian calendar. Hippolytus, who was a, a, a Roman uh, 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 historian, but also a... a a member of the of the early founding of the church and without going into that the enormous problem the romans had and why they kept crucifying jesus and all the the apostles that they could get their hands on and and they went after mary magdalene as well is because this religion was sweeping their empire and they needed to stop it because they wanted rome to persist which is an all male hierarchical um you know uh, civilization so Hippolytus states that Jesus was born on Wednesday, December 25th, in the 42nd year of Augustus, which is Julian calendar, not, not lunar calendar, 5,500 years after Adam. And he died in his 33rd year of life on Friday, March 25th, in the 18th year of Tiberius. So in AD 29. Now you have to understand March 25th is not march 25th on our current calendar that is on the julian calendar now julian calendar and gregorian are identical they both have a leap year to absorb 0 0.25 0 0.25 of i need to really show this this time because last time i i couldn't actually find it but it's called the sidereal sidereal earth year is there you go so let's just do it. Sidereal year is right here. Let me I finally I got it this time. So you you can really see this. I'm not making this stuff up. This is an exact sidereal year. 365.256363004. Now watch this. So I take that number. That's the exact amount of days for the earth to go around the sun. And then you also have a tropical year. The, the difference is only, um, it's so small, it's it's 365.24219, and, and you can see the decimals right underneath below. On a calculator, that won't show up as much. So what happens is you take this number, uh, let me just go to my, um, share screen calculator so you can really appreciate this okay now yes. let yeah. me clarify that you're using this um i forget what it's called but it has to do with the fact that all the planets trail the sun i think it's the sun that goes is actually moving through space um and we're actually following it so yes i guess we have a rotation within that but you know where I'm going with this? It's called the helio something. Um, Heliocentric versus, yeah. Yeah. Right. And so you're gets, using that, the, right? The, the earth spins around once per, you know, earth day, which then goes around the sun every 365.256 days per, you know, digital year. Right. Even though there are anomalies, it doesn't do it exactly every year. I've got this down to the nanosecond. And, <laughs> and the fact that it's not like clockwork, like a digital computer, means that there are gravitational bodies 
that were unresolved that are pulling on the orbits of the inner planets that they can't resolve that cause us to have these little time shifts every year, which means there has to be other planetary bodies, right? There has right. So then the next, I'm, I'm going to show you this. So I take the number 591 from my wife. Which again, by, I just want to say is 19.5, the Hoagland number. Right. The Hoagland and he was number. just talking about that on his own, on a, the show, the interview he recently did, which I would like to hear your point of view on the glass structure over the moon but let's continue on this subject i yeah, I, when, I don't yeah. want to distract you but i'd like to later towards the end talk about that okay yeah because richard and i are have talked last night so we'll, we'll get <laughs> richard's mind on this which he hasn't done yet right you're going to see something really miraculous because his mind is incredible like yours you you've got to share knowledge to synthesize it, to really see what you're really looking at. Well, I love the fact that your wife's number, 591, is actually 19.5. And that has to be really, like, that emphasizes the importance of it in my mind. Well, because that, they're, they're reverse. And antimatter, an antimatter universe, everything's in reverse, mm -hmm. right? So the three, the, if you look on the screen, the 356.256363004 is the sidereal year. The second number is the number my wife gives me, which is 591 divided by the golden ratio. You see how close they are? Right. So for me to calculate their, their percentage difference, all I do is, this is the fast way to do it on a calculator. So I put the smaller number, which is my my wife's number uh no sorry i have to put the sidereal number in first so i put three five six you're not going to believe how accurate how little difference there is between them and remember their number changes every year by a shaving so well, i'm going to show you in a second i'm going to show you how accurate this is again how could my wife do this is the question and Really, remember, I'm looking for proof of where we are after this. I'm not looking for somebody's belief system. I want to know where we really go. So there's the sidereal year, and I'm going to divide that by my wife's calculation. And the accuracy is 99.999% .999 of each other. Like, how could she do that? I. It's like taking the orbit of Earth, and multiplying it by the long-form golden ratio, and that's where she is. She's at planet 591. But we don't know of a planet at 591 days. That's a tad short of Mars and might actually be where Theia, which is now no longer a hypothetical planet, astronomers have actually calculated the orbit of Theia, which was destroyed, which means in, in a hyperdimensional sense, its energy is still there. So now watch, this is where it's going to get really mind-blowing. So mm -hmm. let me show again my, before we get into, this is the full chart of all the planets based on the calculation my wife gave me. And what it shows is, you see, there's Earth. I'm, I'm only doing it accurate to a few decimals because I don't need to for my chart. I wouldn't have room to put all the numbers in. But there's 591, which I'm calling above the firmament. Now, I don't know if that's actually the biblical firmament. I know in, in, in dimensional terms, if all their electrons of what we'll call the hyperdimensional planets are spinning opposite to our electrons, so our electrons and all the material matter form are spinning negative, which is counterclockwise from the top the north side of an atom which is what's called spin on in atomic states so when antimatter was discovered and we, we covered this last time in part one they actually photographed it and they realized there can be antimatter solar systems and i demonstrated that last time for okay reason. can i ask you if you would consider that the same as what i might know of as parallel earth you know, really, really could. In fact, you know, one of my favorite shows on TV is Fringe because yeah, mine too, mine too. I'm, <laughs> I'm rewatching Fringe again. Because yeah, it goes 
it's so good that. actually the series is amazing when you re watch it now it's just so oh, yeah. they disclose so all, many secrets in that series i know I, and i love walter and my my youngest daughter who's only <laughs> to walter because he's so hilarious but so so there you go so right. so earth um d again divided by the golden ratio gave me venus but divided by the golden ratio again above the line gave me this planet of 139 0.51 days. And again, the number of times the word heaven, which is actually from the original Greek is Oranos, and Oranos actually means a Greek god, goddess that cohabited with Earth, Gaia, and created the Titans who created the Olympians, Zeus is the chief of the Olympians, who created the human race. That's in the Greek mythology. And most Christians don't know your Bible was not written in English. English did not exist yet. It didn't exist for <laughs> 500 more years. Right. It was written in Greek, the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So if you, you whenever you're confused, go to the Greek. So um, um, so anyway, so the two orbits of 139, remember the Bible takes 139 times twice, which on a calculator, 139 orbits times two, is 278 days so 278 days into your solar year and i'll show you how we calculate the, the start date we will line up with the miracle of the sun at fatima which is mid-october so that's october 13th and that is gregorian calendar because it's 1917 we switch to gregorian from the uh from the uh, uh, Julian calendar in the 16th century, the, the mid end of the 16th century, one orbit of 139 lines up perfectly with the celebrated birthday of the Buddha. And also one orbit of 139 lines up with the first appearance of the mother of Jesus appearing to the three children in, in Portugal, Fatima, which was May the 13th. So it also happens to line up with the the, the ascension date of St. Francis and St. Teresa. Now, just don't think that I'm speaking in terms of, of the Vatican and the current church being a, a, a body of perfection, because I believe it's a body <laughs> of total corruption. I believe they, they steal, they stole the saints, they stole illuminated people to build themselves up. But with the platform they're sitting on, utterly destroyed true the true Christian religion completely destroyed it. And so we won't Okay. Really now I, I want to pause you one second yeah. because okay. your your gra your graph or your picture here says John Denver Ascension Day. I that's a bit weird. Let me tell you something that John Denver is alive. Uh, I, this is what I've been told. And I think that I might have even met him in person, but he was dressed as Fus Fusca which you might not know about that disguise, but there's a fuss, there's this disguise that celebrities have been using for uh, years and years and years, and he uses it. And I actually, I think he attended the Patriot Double Down. Um, I was given a heads up about this. And so I actually went over to him. He was leaning against a post, watching Juan O'Savin give his speech at the Patriot Double Down in Vegas. And this is a couple of years ago or three years ago. And, um, and I actually measured him. I know this sounds insane, but I measured him with my hand. He didn't like that I did this at all. You know, I just, I was friendly. I said, hi, you know, um, I'm Carrie. I, I, I can see that you're not John, meaning John, because some people were saying John Jr. was in disguise as Fusca, which he has been, but not in that event because she was on stage. So I wanted to see who the guy was. So I put my hand out over his head. He's not very tall. And, um, you know, I, he, like I said, he didn't really like that I did that. And then pretty soon after that, he left. But I was told by a person in the crowd that that was John Denver. I, I know that sounds crazy, but there seems to be a whole litany of stuff out well, there. It's the same with Elvis. Like if a, if a notable person wanted to go invisible just to live in peace, they would do something like that. I yeah. happen to be friends with John Denver's last wife, Cassandra Denver. So is it possible i mean like with elvis if they want yeah to just, there is here. i'm just so saying so i just think you know to be a little careful with that ascension well, date. well that's the date that's the date that again he's 
his date is mid-October, which again, we can go into the, this is going to really matter in a few minutes. You, you'll see why. All right. 39, I believe, okay, so this is, this is where it starts to get really amazing because we haven't gone from 591 to the outer solar system yet, but we just watched what happens. So let's go, I'm going to show some slides here, the calculations I did last night on dates. And I just simply use this. Um, okay, first you have to identify January 7th. So I have to do that first. So I showed this. Now um, I'm going to show where I started today. It, it, this is going to get more and more mind boggling. Again, when you, when your mind gets boggled, you don't necessarily know why. So again, to find the true date of Christmas and Easter, we have to rely on the Julian calendar for March 25th would be Good Friday. In the 18th year of Tiberius, it's just they're on the Julian calendar in AD 29. So why should Christmas be January 6th and the 7th instead of December 25th on the current calendar? And when we switch from the Julian calendar day Thursday, the 4th of October, 1582, was immediately became Friday, October 15th, immediately, on the same day. And that happens to be the exact day that Teresa of Avila dies. She dies right exactly when they do this, and that there's no way that could have been planned. So um, note that it's mid-October. Now, if we count December 25th, Julian, plus 11 days, because you notice this is an 11-day correction. From the 4th of October to the 15th is 11 days. So we jump forward 11 days. So now because the first Christians on the old calendar were at December 25th, you have to move Christmas 11 days forward, which will put us at, um, will put us at January 5th, Gregorian, of course. On this particular time period, the the uh, the Catholic Church th th did not move Christmas forward to January fifth. Okay, but let me just say that according to one hundred seven, uh, Christmas the twenty fifth is actually yes chosen by the Illuminati because it is somehow linked to uh, a Luciferian um, objective. Okay, so and and that's exactly what the arguments were in Rome in the very beginning, and that's so strange that they kept that date, which is which is now wrong. So in the Julian calendars, the only difference between Julian and Gregorian, if you were true Julian, and you had a Stonehenge, and you're watching the sun rise at the summer solstice and winter solstice. You could correct your calendar every, it would be 158 years, you would go off one, one day. Because you're already absorbing on Julian and Gregorian the quarter on Mark, right? So remember, the sidereal year is 0.25. They only resolve the 0.25, not the 0063630004. So when you multiply that by 158 years, you get one year off every 158 years since we switched in 1582. So 1582 to today's date of 2024 is 442 years divided by 158 years. We're 2.79 days off right now. And you're going to what's going to really blow everybody's mind is when I remind me today to go to the Stephenville UFO case in Texas, because there's two sightings and they're both. Perfect in, in this correction in Stephenville, which is going to tell us where those craft are from. Okay, but why does the correction, I, I, I'm going to guess, but you need to tell me. So why does the correction matter? I mean, like, why it do we have to, to be find, so accurate to find the hidden planet? Yes, it, you won't find your hidden planets without the correction. You won't know okay. where they are right now. Right. Okay, and did anyone step forward to help you pinpoint this using your... I, I have a guy who works for a defense contractor in Colorado who says he can do it. It's somebody I already know, but he did watch the presentation. And okay. So we're on to that. So cool. So when you look at, again, 1582 to, to 2024, 
four is four and forty two years later. We're, 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 we should be two point seven nine days further forward. But you can't take a point seven two nine days on a calendar. We can only take two. So that brings January fifth to January seventh. You'll see why this matters because this is not Jesus's birthday. This is the day according to the original book of Matthew, which the very first church headed by James in Jerusalem, the brother of Jesus, the physical brother of Jesus, by the way, which is proven, that, that he used. James did not use any other Gospels. They didn't even exist yet. And in this first Matthew, the anointing of Christ by John the Baptist, which is the moment he becomes illuminated, is... Would have been December 25th on the old calendar, but today would be January 7th. They do, they did the baptisms on certain dates, which were dates of absolute alignments. So again, we showed last time what January 7th is. It's three days ahead of perihelion. And on, on a true, actually, I should show that again, because once we have the perfection of January 7th, and you have then understand how you're going to find Easter. So Hippolytus states Jesus was born Wednesday, December 25th in the 42nd year, although that's not when he was born. That's when he was born again, meaning that he became illuminated. His physical birth is a different date. And he died in his 33rd year of life. Notice that there's, it's, there's a span of 33 years. This is going to really matter to find our planet. It's going to really matter. So... If we calculate Jesus' crucifixion of Friday, March 25th, because that's what Hippolytus gave us, and you correct it and you move it forward 13.79 days, you will get April 8th as Good Friday, which was the date of the eclipse we just had on today's calendar. Incredible. And then this would make true Easter today. But the, because you have 0.79, the changeover happened oh, sometime I see. last night into today. Right? So that means, and I, I don't know if you're seeing this yet on Facebook, Terry, but somebody in Montana was posting photos of a third luminous sphere during the eclipse, and it got everybody upset. And then another guy posted a photo Okay. Oh, no, I don't think I did. Okay, so we'll get into that later. So what? All right. So remember, the weather was cloudy in most places. So most of us, including me, I took really good pictures with an amazing Nikon through the clouds and come in the, and it was coming out of the clouds and coming into the clouds. And my location is very close to where this guy got his photo in Missoula, um, Montana. I'm in, I'm just north of him northwest of him because i'm just north of northern idaho in the nelson british columbia area in canada so so now watch what happens okay it's going to get much more interesting so when we go to okay we're going to go to this one this is this okay is, now let me say yeah. that in the yeah. chat um people i can see the chat actually I, I i was i brought up another page and i could go to my you know as a viewer and um, what happens is it says um, someone keeps saying that it doesn't move anywhere, same night sky all year. Does that make any sense? No, that doesn't make any, that doesn't make it. That's not what we see. If you had a flat earth, um, you wouldn't even see that. No, no, we don't. I mean, I watch the stars all the time. You don't see this only when you look to the north. So when you look to the north, you, you lock onto the North Star in Polaris. And throughout the year, all your constellations are moving. I think around. they change the, the big bear, um, right? The bear constellation, and then which is the Big Dipper, and then different parts of the year. You know, you see Sirius and Orion and Pleiades in the Grand Gallery, and then you won't see them anymore at a certain hour. So, um, so anyway, so staying focused here. Watch this. Okay, this is this is going to get interesting. So, for, notice there are two Fatimas. And we talked about this last time, that when you get what's called a transit of an inner planet, which is Mercury and Venus, are the only visible inner planets we know about between the Earth and the Sun, 
they come, uh, transits of Venus come in pairs. And they come in pairs over every hundred and something years, but but it's it's a different number every time the pairs show up. The pairs are are reasonably close together in Venus transits. So there are two Fatimas, and the the first Fatima is October 13th, 1917, but 33 years later in 1950, Pope Pius XII claims to have seen the same thing at 4 p.m. on the 30th of October. So you're in late October. And he sees it a number of times, and then again on November 1st. Notice it's 33 years apart. How long did Jesus live? 33 years, according to Hippolytus. Now, what happens in the span of those 33 years is you have two appearances of your planet. And this, this is where my main focus is, is not challenging people's beliefs. I want to know where this planet is. And, and those two appearances of the planet are... You're going to see this in a second. Um, the, uh, the 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 Bethlehem star. I'm just going to show a little graphic of this because it's kind of fun. And the Bethlehem star was never resolved to be Jupiter Saturn conjunction. This planet it shows up at nighttime in the sky upon his birth and probably would have been there for a great a number of days at the very least for a duration it's 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 a physical whatever it is in the sky whatever it is it's there you you mark it on that date now notice that okay um i i want to ask you and you can go ahead and finish your sentence or yeah whatever but i want to ask you the significance of this planet like beyond if if it's there let's say you prove it it is there and then we got somebody who can actually find exactly where it is and maybe using special equipment can see it actually see it even though it's it may be partly interdimensional so complete what you're going to talk about but i i want you to also explain why does it matter so much that we have hidden planets and this one maybe in particular? Well, what matters to me is is one where when, and again, I would I would have to say it was Pythagoras who actually started this because Pythagoras says that it's not a belief system for them. They they did exercise, they did musical frequency toning exercises the Pythagoreans they they tuned their musical instruments to scales and number frequencies that we don't even know about actually that allowed them to have the direct experiences of visiting these planets and seeing the proof that in, in other dimensions you could call it or you could call it afterlife or you could even call it possible in this dimension that there is life in the solar system and to me living on a planet where we have these rulers who have been so corrupt for thousands of years, I kind of feel like I'm on a prison planet. In fact, I think many, many people, even reportedly in the media today, feel like their job and, and they just barely make enough money to survive that they feel like prisoners. And this consciousness of this planet doesn't seem to be able to get out of that. And, and people have ideas if they have tons of money that they're somehow they're free. You know, what I've found in 45 years of daily meditation and, and tuning exercises is by shifting the ability to perceive higher states of consciousness within is the only way you really get free of suffering and limitation in consciousness. But but to know that there's other spheres right that are not light years away from us that are right here. And, and that my wife is calling me from this number and this mathematical formula that shows me where they are. One is proof of life after death, which is very different than the tunnel of light. And the tunnel of light even suggests going through a membrane, like you could call it a firmament, mm -hmm. and popping out on the other side and seeing all these other planets like Pythagoras you know, talked about. So that's why it matters to me.
because okay. I don't just want to believe. And, <laughs> and that's why I'm making a full graphic visual presentation film on this right now. So now when we come back to where I was going, there the two Fatimas recorded are 33 years apart because Pope Pius the 12th, and, and again, I believe almost all the popes are completely corrupt. So I, I really don't want to, I don't want people to think that that's my resonance, but I want you, it's just a noted fact. He saw this. So of course, Jesus lived 33 years. So the first appearance of the planet would be the star of Bethlehem. And the second appearance of the planet would be the three hours of darkness eclipse at the moment of the crucifixion. And no astronomer has ever resolved that. A, a body covered the sun, produced an enormous shadow as far as the eye could see. It wasn't described as a small shadow. And it's really interesting because um, we're going to go to Stephenville in a few minutes. The Stephenville, Texas UFO, the first case is this deer hunter. And, it, and, it, and in the Spielberg series on Netflix, you have to do the math yourself because they seem to be afraid of telling you the date of the deer hunter guy. But the deer hunter guy lines up to December 25th. But the the main sighting at Stephenville is January the 8th. <laughs> And and remember, we're 0.79 into January the 8th and, and starting on the 7th for our perfect date of recalibrating the calendar. So what interests me about that is, is how you've got two appearances in both dates in question, December 25th and January 7th, 8th. Now remember, Nikola Tesla dies on January 7th going into the 8th in in. And so you, 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 when you see that, when you see that, you, you have to wonder what it is. So watch. So Jesus is on the cross. It can't be a UFO because this, this hunter is in, in broad daylight. And, and if you do the math, it's Christmas Day, December 25th. What they tell you is it, it's two weeks before the January 7th sighting. Well, 14 days before January 7th, January 8th sighting is Christmas Day. So, so there you go. He's, the deer hunter is, he's either out on the 25th or the 26th of December, and he says that it day turned into night, but you could, but it wasn't, the ship was, he could see that there were no rivets, there was no bolts, it was not something manufactured on earth, and I have his name and everything, which I'll go into a minute. So just going, going back to the crucifixion moment in the three hours of darkness was recorded was not proven to be a solar eclipse of the moon, was not proven to be a Venus transit either. So it would mean there is a planetary body that appeared 33 years apart. And if I go to the Fatima record, I have two appearances 33 years apart. So what is it that, that lined up with the sun that day? If it was a mothership, now remember, my, if I go back to my chart, Kerry, I don't know for certain that these positions that my wife is giving me in the formula are actually planets. I just know they're there in the math, as above, so below, um, um, as above, so below. Let's go back to the chart here. Everything is golden ratio in nature from the spirals and seashells to the spiral of the Milky Way galaxy to flowers and plants. I mean, the golden ratio is so well proven. I, I mean, I don't need to spend an hour on the golden ratio. So 591 divided by the golden ratio is Earth. Divided by the golden ratio is Venus. Divided by the golden ratio is a is a point. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's time. good. That orbits at 139.51 days. I don't know that this is a planet. I just know this is the way nature builds things. Divided by the golden ratio is Mercury. Divided by the golden ratio two times. I've got two more spheres between Mercury and Vulcan. Divided by the golden ratio again, I get Vulcan. 591 times the golden ratio gives me um, a planet at 956 days around the sun and lines up to dwarf planet Ceres in, in Ceres is about 900. It's almost 3000 miles around. So it's a decent size. 
divide it times the golden ratio again, I get the orbit of, of another trans dimensional planet divided by the golden ratio. I get Jupiter divided by the okay. Golden ratio. So that, there you go. That's a fascinating thing. Now, now let, let me ask you this. So what about the idea that what is a planet, okay, or a planetoid? Mm -hmm. So it's a sphere and it is, you know, like they say it, it it's like um, it's a it's a, actually a vortex, but it, it it's a solid vortex, it's solidified in a certain way, and it's mm -hmm. materialized. Because when the material is, you know, when it's circulating and, and it, you can, you just go through it. Right. But when it gets more into the material realm, it kind of hardens and, and gets more fixated. So a planet is almost like a point in space, but it's substantial, right. Depending on different sizes and all that. But I think what you have to do to drill down in this whole area of these hidden planets and why they're there it's almost as if in order for the structure of our solar system to be even a structure of any kind, that it needs these pinpointed solid vortex, what originally came from toroidal, you know, right. physics, these, these planets. Okay. So now what is a planet? So plan net, it's a net. It's actually a kind of a net. It captures stuff. It is. It, it is. captures it is. matter and it, it attracts matter. So it attracts also beings later on once it's it's constructed. And then it moves in this sort of configuration that we call heliocentric, if you're using that more accurate model. In other words, I'm just saying that it's kind of fascinating to think about this. The idea that they're hidden and they could be part of the parallel universe, but we don't see them physically, but they do exist from this dimension, at least from, from my point of view. Because I always think that I, there's a lot, I, I don't know if you follow the work of Ashiana Dean at all, but in the Guardian materials, they talk about parallel Earth. And parallel Earth is a major, I don't know what you want to call it, um, it's in opposition, in a sense, to us right now. Yeah, that would be antimatter, yeah. Yeah, and what they are, the objective of the deep space, the deep, you know, deep state, I mean, <laughs> deep space, deep state, um, is to, you know, secret space program is in part, one of the things they do is they bring over, you have a double, we all have doubles on parallel earth, and they bring over the double, and that is depicted in Fringe. So, and also there's another similar one called Counterpart, in case you didn't see that one. Oh, I got to see that. Yeah, it's a sci-fi series. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that this has got, some, for people that are listening, this does have some, a, a fair amount of substantiation going across uh, spiritual investigations and, and other, even uh, in the, the world of physics, this idea, you can look into science and find documented investigations into this idea of what what you're calling antimatter but what also could be called this parallel universe or parallel you know earth and it but everything in other, and, it, and it has a substantial reason also because everything in the way the illuminati look at the world has to do with the um sort of the positive and the negative okay so there's always two there's never just one so that's something to there has remember. to be too because we can record every day a certain amount of antimatter is in equilibrium opposite but not equal but maintaining the equilibrium between the earth's constant antimatter generated by mega lightning strikes and the the opposite which is matter without that antimatter opposite we wouldn't be here right so technically, even though the amount of antimatter on Earth being generated and annihilated constantly is maintaining the, the balance between the two, on the flip side of the Earth, you would have a tiny amount of matter and mostly antimatter. Yes. That would be, in physics, provable 
very, very, very. And well. it's totally depicted in, in, in Fringe and substantiated, you know, with all kinds of clues. But, but Fringe is even more brilliant because according to Richard Feynman, antimatter is going backwards in time and we're going forward in time. And it's also to do with, um, see this idea that every, see every action engenders a reaction or an opposite. Yeah, Newton said. And, opposite, and, and, and this is where you get that, you might've seen this, this uh, I forget what it's called. It, there was a series about if the Nazis won the war, right? This was a, yeah, called the, the tall yeah, yeah. castle, the man in the tall castle or something like that. It's, yeah. it's a, it's, Anyway, um, it's no, it's really interesting. And why it's even more interesting is I have a secret witness and I did a presentation about this. So you can actually watch me talk about what I did is I he told me his story and then he wouldn't come forward in person and hopefully he's still alive. Um, and he considered himself to be a secret son of Werner von Braun. And he had a story to tell. So I spent hours on the phone getting his story. And the story was that there is a whole slew of individuals that have been brought over from parallel earth. And there are scientists and engineers and all these kinds of ones that supposedly might have died here or just gotten too old or whatever. So instead of cloning them and, and all that kind of stuff, they actually went and got the double from, from parallel earth. And that's an interesting dynamic. So what he said is they really do do this. And they have meetings of these people who have come over from there and know each other over here and have, you know, meetings and stuff. Yeah, I, I believe it's an incredible it's story. It's, it's very incredible, I think. Yeah, so we, we have, uh, let, let me demonstrate an experiment I did to confirm this. And it confirms what you just said, too. So if you go to... Again, I'll go back to my graphic for just a minute. The more people, I mean, I can say, I'm, I can, I'm doing a whole film on this, and I think the visual film work will make this clear. So when you look at Earth and then Venus, 224-701, is between Mercury and Venus. Now, one thing you can see, when you calculate the wavelength, which is based on the circumference of planets, I can see all our planets are in pairs. Uranus and Neptune are so close in size, so their frequency wavelength is, is so close. Jupiter, Saturn are like, they're, they're like couples. They're almost the same frequency. They're just- Fascinating. Huh. But Mars and Theia, the speculative size based on mathematics that NASA has, you can look up Theia on Wikipedia, people, if you want to. Their frequency wavelengths are almost the same. Earth and Venus are just a smidgen apart in their frequency wavelength. Hmm. So therefore, Mercury and 139 are almost the same frequency. So I was able to calculate the frequency of 139, and I transmitted it last summer through my big cube, you know, counter-rotational scalar um, um, coils. And I'm lying on the balcony. I'm having a nap because I put a big mattress up on my second story balcony and it's a sunny day and i hear a man call out my name david and it's so clear and then he started speaking in this it sounded like ancient hebrew and i get my phone and i go to my star finder app which is i use you know i use star walk 2 and i point my phone up where i heard the voice and it's right between mercury and venus Wow. I audibly heard this. And, and so, again, when when you know the frequency of a planet and you just, this is how radios work. If your receiver and your transmitter are the same frequency, you have real communication. Yes. And, I mean, I think, um, you, you know, that. your your partner, that guy, what's his name? Um, the one who does all the calculations of, of stuff. Jimmy, um, Jimmy Blanchett. Yeah, so he he talks about this kind of stuff, right? He's right. all interested in how communicating with the different. Well, I guess. Well, cultures. Jimmy's whole experience starts exactly right here. I'll show you when Jimmy's. Let's go back to the graph. But it's a very interesting idea. So I just want to say, a vortex yeah. is also a door. Right. 
So when a door opens is when the communication com comes through. And that's why these configurations that you're doing mathematically matter. Because so those may be... a planet there. You're right. It could be... When planets were in their early formation, they were just vortices. So what if... Now, this news broke last year in the physics community. It was on every news channel in the world that physicists generating antimatter wanted to know if gravity, hence from our sun and earth, would still pull it towards it. And it proved it did, which mm -hmm. would mean a, a, a body of antimatter would still orbit around our star, our sun. And that is important in this discovery. But again, watch, it, this is going to get more mind blowing because we're, you're going to see where this goes. It's going to go somewhere really incredible. So you go back to your original graphic because I want to point out Jimmy Blanchett because you brought him up. And Jimmy and I started the day before my wife's death, which was August 8th, 2021. We sent out a transmission that bounced off the moon and hit the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And that was August the 8th. Of the year 2017, when the Muamua was coming in, Jimmy began having his experiences on the radios tuned to 432 and 144 megahertz. That's when it started. And somehow this uh, what what started in Jimmy's life lines up with the August 21st eclipse. Now now mm. this is where it's going to get mind-boggling again because I'm going to show my screenshots of my calculations. Just watch this. This, this is this is really really mind-bending. So watch. So we go to share screen if you use this app online, subtract number of days or add, starting from January 7th, we all know what that is now. Remember, Stephenville was January the 8th, the big sighting of, of 2008. And the first sighting was January December 25th, 2007. All I did is subtracted 139 days and look at the date I got, August 21st, the date of the first eclipse in the American Triangle which is my birthday. I didn't find out about 139 until my wife's formula. Is she trying to tell me where she is and the date she calls out my name produces a formula that leads to my birthday? It's going to get even more amazing because I'm I'm not even done yet. So now, another okay. calculation. I just want to throw one other idea yeah. in here, and that has to do with the NASA launches of space vehicles so they choose certain dates but I, you probably haven't done this yet but you could take those dates and put them into this formula that you're creating Ooh, and see oh. if there is something going on with why they chose those particular dates because if i'm saying a window opens a door opens and the eclipse technically is a door that's why the you know i told you you know something comes in when it's a solar something goes out when it's a lunar kind of whatever. And so what happens is it's it's the the NASA is totally tied to the Illuminati. Right. And it is, you know, like never stay straight answer <laughs> sort of thing. And it's no, it's a cover organization for the real secret space program. So what happens is they chose certain launch dates. There might be something about a doorway opening that allows space travel, you know, to get off the planet let's say, at those particular times? Well, there, there's more dates that I have. Of course, we have the May, the mid-May, we have the mid-October. We proved last time that the chief cornerstone of the White House was laid, laid on October 13th, 225 years Because ago. they're really obsessed with these, you know, dates. No, but there's, you're going to see the same thing with the UFOs. The, inversely, they come in on certain dates. Okay. So let me show the next message before we go to the UFOs. So, this one is January 7th. I have to use a non-leap year, so I use 2021. And I added the 591 days because my wife called out 591 days. I got August 21st again, but a year later. Like, how is this happening? <laughs> That's my birthday. Is, is this message to me or is the birthday of Jesus in Urantia correct? I don't know the answer. Now, I'm not done yet. Watch, I'm going to show you another one because I'm gonna do Venus next. So you're gonna see January 
7th, because that's my new start date. I showed why that is. And I added Venus, and I got to August 20th. Holy cow. Now I'm in a visible planet. And I'm still showing up around August 21st. Okay, now one more. I'll show you another calculation. And this is... That's the same one. This next one is January 7th plus. If I go plus or minus, okay, now I'm going to go to the next number. Okay, so let's go back. I want people to see where I got this number from. So you're going to go to my original catalog. Okay, so look at this. I'm now going, and again, this is based on my Weiss formula, going back to the original chart. I'm going to go to planet 956. I'm going to start on January 7th, okay? And that's in, in the harmony, 591 to the golden ratio, going to the outer regions. So share screen, and I'm going to go to, oh boy, sorry, I got to go back, quit. And then I have to find my graphic again. I guess I have to go all the way down here. And it's January. Here it is. Th this, this is mind-blowing, Carrie. I, I don't know why this is happening, but this is a the real calculation. So I take January 7th. I use 1961, the year I was born, plus 956 days. I got to August 21st again. Remember. The first eclipse when Oumuamua was coming in in 2017 was August 21st. So why, why? I mean, I did Venus. I did th three invisible planets, and I'm still getting to August 21st. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, very it's weird. It's going to take me a while to figure this out. Why? Okay, why so these planets, planets, okay, what is it? What are you saying? about the planets in that date are you saying Remember, the, january 7 i'm using as my start date right right in my calendar which is three days after perihelion and perihelion changes by one day sometimes two days every year whereas the winter solstice and summer solstice and the spring and fall equinoxes are fixed right now they don't move they should but we fix them in our calendar which is why our calendar is wrong. Again, if you had a Stonehenge and you were a timekeeper and then the sun and 139 years from now moves out a day and then 300 and something years from now moves out two days, you're going to know on your Stonehenge, on your sunrise at summer solstice, if you're wrong. But if you're keeping, if you're keeping time um, the wrong way, you're going to fall out of alignment. And that's that's what I'm saying. So I'm using January 7th, which is recalibrated to perfection to today's calendar as my start date. I'm only adding and subtracting the numbers of the number of days in Earth time for the orbits of planet 139, planet 591, and now 956. And I keep showing up at August 21st. And August 21st, if we go back, to our three and you're saying technically that's the date of birth of jesus right well no, the arantia book is the only place we know where the birth date of jesus is august 21st you see there's your first eclipse total eclipse of 2017 right as momo is coming in is august 21st hey what do you mean by the first eclipse because they have well, every year of the three that form the triangle of 26.3 oh. degrees. Okay. April 8th being the last one. Well, I mean, what is this? But think about this. So what is the significance of August 21st as a date to come in? Being born is means coming in, right? Coming into this dimension, right? So that's when Jesus was manifested as a being on this planet and then it seems to correlate where to where the planets position themselves right and remember he he's he's born when the planet uh, appears above his birth which i'm saying is the star bethlehem he dies when the same planet transits and creates the shadow or the eclipse at the hour of the eclipse of his crucifixion 33 years apart because he lived to be 33 years and fatima one and fatima two well, are let me years apart 
Okay. So let me bring something else in. So if that's true, that may be corresponding to the, the, the number 33 of the, uh, you know, um, what do they call the levels of the Illuminati? You know, you get 33 degrees. So beyond that is the secrets are revealed to the person, the adept who makes it to 33 degrees. Before that, well, Mula, they don't Mula know the came in at 33 degrees, by the way. So it crosses the eclipse. So there's a significance to them having to do with, again, you could think of illumination as being the opposite of occulting. So illumination is something visible, becoming visible shining out right whereas occulting is hiding it so again so the 33 the is a cutoff did. it's a it's a cutoff between the one and the other so it's 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 actually like that cutoff date i believe the vatican hid it they hid the a real illumination certain aspects see some people see the negative aspect of illuminati but there's also a positive aspect in there you always get both right the god of the old testament is not the same person deity but it claims it and it's the same like the washington monument harmonics i mentioned the evil goes right in and claims it the vatican which is really the remnants of the Roman Empire, claims the new religion. Okay, but you could also religion. think of it as the point of balance between the light and the dark, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just saying that that's an interesting idea um, because in, in a polarized, you know, we're, we live in a system of, of polarities. Again, two, everything's two. And then, you know, and even our brains, two sides of our brain, two sides, masculine, feminine, that kind of thing. So I'm just saying for the, in, for the occult, their obsession has to do a lot. And, you know, they're bringing in, they do a lot of things literally, which is, you know, actually stupid, but it's insane, but they are insane in their way. So like with, uh, kind of like hermaphrodite kind of beings and right now where they're trying to merge the sexes into this miasma of, of like you're not male you're not female you're both you know kind of thing which is 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 actually um it theoretically true but they're trying to manifest it you know like michael well i'm just saying you know the um basically that you know obama's so-called partner is uh is male and female they're trying there are a lot of beings right now trying to be that which is a literal interpretation is trying to manifest that again that point that midpoint so it's a very interesting straddling the two the two dimension the two sides and perhaps dimensions what does that do it opens a door again it makes you you are already a portal but it it actually opens the portal door so th they're going to use this constantly so let's get back to the 139 so again this i think your model is really fascinating i think maybe you've hit on something that scientists either if they know about it they've refused to tell us right oh i, I think the illuminati and the master stone builders when they set the washington monument on the same date that Fatima would be 225 years later, they knew about Planet 139. I think the the Vatican, which again, the Vatican didn't exist in the first church of James. James is the first church. But then they killed James. The Romans killed him under orders from the new, uh, uh, the, the new Jewish temple head which is really a family that is, is in competition for power. So they would hide the deepest knowledge, absolutely. But but when you really go really deep, like, like we went into, we started um, last time with the pyramid and the ascending angle of the Grand Gallery and the ascending passage being 26.3 degrees. And when I added all the degrees of all the tilt angles of the planets in the, in the solar system, including Ceres, I got 333.7 degrees and when i add 26.3 i complete the circle i have a 360 degree circle so that means the pyramid ties into planet 139 and i also mentioned how the queen's chamber is the same measurement as moses's original holy boys 10 by 10 cubits the king's chamber is 10 by 20 cubits which is the original measurement of 
the tent that was called the holy place. So who is God really? When, when what one thing Peter Nazaria does in the Great Pyramid Decoded, and he it's, he's really really the most brilliant author. He shows you the transmigration of the word Huffa, which became Kuffa, which became Kufu, which is really Yalwa. And 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 I demonstrated phonetically when you listen to the sound of our sun, it's a wo 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 sound. Then you you then you tie into raw. But what we do, you see, when we took in the proverbial knowledge of good and evil, which is taking judgment, we judge each other and we polarize each other as opposite and becoming enemy because we change the word of a God of, of a vibrational sound, which supposedly you can't utter. And then we turn it into Jehovah and to Jah and to Yahweh, and then we're all fighting, thinking we have a different God, because we pronounce it differently, which is why the, the, the being said, don't pronounce this. And so when you take in judgment, it, myopically, as an ego, you're always going to be opposite somebody, right? Jesus said, if Satan's kingdom be divided, how shall it stand? Christian right. churches are all divided. They're all fighting each other, because the disagreement comes from interpretation, which comes from language, which is sonics, which is vibration. So then what he's saying is the Egyptians worshipped, the, the, the creator of the Great Pyramid was, was, was Kufa, which became Khufu. Because, but there is no Khufu person. <laughs> they, they turned it into a person as a deity, and they think Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, is a different person deity but really is all coming back to the original which is why the measurements are the same as moses is because there again there's two gods in the old testament but they merged them into one one is a warrior conqueror the other one is saying don't take in the knowledge of judgment live naked have babies have sex make love not war and the other one is saying war right but they both claim to be the same person because we get stuck in word, written word, right? So there, I believe the pyramid, which is where we started with the 26.3 degrees being evident in the triangle of the three eclipses, is, is proof that there is a missing planet with an angle of 26.3 degrees that the, you see, when the pyramid was opened, and it was sealed at the time of Christ, and Christ was raised in Egypt, and so was Moses. It was never opened. And when they finally opened it, and nobody knows whether it's Napoleon's army that opened it, which is probably the prevailing theory, there's no hieroglyphs in there. There's nothing written on the walls in there at all. That's right. And But let me say this. Okay, this is something that I basically downloaded psychically. Mm -hmm. What you're saying openly, opened, it, it means actually the pyramid is the door. What we use as the door is not the door. You, you know that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I assume you know this. Um, the the so-called entrance that we use is actually, in a sense, the back entrance. It's not the official real entrance to the pyramids. Oh, I believe you 100%. Yeah. And if you go in there often enough, which I have, um, every time I go in there, I am aware of this. I don't know why, you know, on a physiological, it's it's like we're coming in, you know, how they, they denigrate the persons like that work for the, you know, higher higher um, elite. They're, they're actually use the kitchen. They use the back door. You're, they're told to use the back door. They never get to come in the front door. It's there's a special, there is a real entrance to the great, for example, I'm talking the great pyramid in specifics. So there's a real entrance. They, I, I don't know if they know where it is or not, but they're not revealing it because they make this big thing about, and do you know, you know, they won't let you, okay, you're not supposed to. I, uh, we have actually photographed the inside, you know, when you walk up and you go inside that whole back door. They don't want you to ever put that. You have to ask yourself, why not? You see what I'm saying? Why don't they? There, it's all it, it is, is is a narrow stone thing with stairs. You know, it doesn't, it's not some big secret, but they don't want you to put it on film, you know? And so there's something, you know, going on with that. So I'm just saying, you're saying 
the door wasn't open, I, I think that's a lie. Now, I think it wasn't open maybe to the public, but it was always open to the adepts and the secret societies. Yeah, the adepts, there had to be a way in there. You're right. There had to be a way in there. And for Jesus to declare he's the missing capstone, and he was raised in Egypt, and so many Christians don't see this. And again, you know, that because they don't want to tie him to the Great Pyramid, right? They just don't want to do that. But when you really get it, what he's referring to, he was raised there. There's a graphic I want to show here really quick of, of another calculation. And I did this years ago because it denotes, okay, so you take the finished height of the Great Pyramid, according to Le Missouri, who's really the greatest mathematician to conquer the pyramid, it's 480.69 feet. Divided by pi, which is how you resolve a circle, 3.14, is 153, which is, a rock just hit my window, which is impossible when I, just when I said that, like literally, it, it, it came in sideways and hit this building really hard. Um, 153 is, is the, is the de-glyphing in, in true gematria of Mary Magdalene's name. And of course, the apostles caught the 153 fish, which is the Vesca Pisces of, of the shape of the Vesca Pisces um, upon his resurrection. So 153 becomes resurrection number. And 153 divided by three is five one, and five one is the is the basis of the angle of the pyramid. In the book of Acts 4, 10 through 12, Jesus refers to himself as that missing cornerstone. Matthew 16, 18, which is the golden ratio. I say to you, Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church. Well, the, the, the pyramid is the only rock we know of that's built on the golden ratio. The whole thing is the golden ratio. If if you real, I mean, I, I could spend hours on the math I've done on the Great Pyramid of Egypt. So the the height of the pyramid finished at 480.69 feet times golden ratio was 777.77 feet. Now, did you know the Vatican, right to the top of the cross, is the same height as the Great Pyramid today without its capstone? The difference is a matter of inches, designed by Michelangelo as one of the chief architects. So what are they saying? They're saying that one again. I believe it's Vatican, life without without grace. In other words, life without this concept of Jesus. Right. This this monument is, is which is, is worshiping Lucifer, the step down. See, if Jesus is God, then Lucifer is the step down. So, what the Vatican worships is Lucifer. Absolutely, because they. They, stole, they kicked all the women. If you read the Gospel of Philip, they kicked the marriage of Jesus and Mary Magdalene out. I know a lot of people don't believe that. I, see, I'm just looking for the truth. I'm not looking to sell a theory. I just want to know where my wife well, is. Well, it is very fascinating, is. though. Um, it's still, okay, but is, I asked you this before last time we talked, and maybe you can answer it a little differently this time. I don't know. So what is planet? 139 what is the significance like what is it is it for example is it nibiru sitting in this other dimension constantly but very close to us or is it another planet you know I, well you can see from the math and I, I believe because everything in nature is a reflection of the golden ratio even the human head from right. measured from the tip of the nose to the soft spot up here to the back of the head is 1 to 1.58, which is so close to 1.618. Actually, if you measure the finished height of the Great Pyramid to one of its sides, it's just under 1 to 1.58, which is the same as the human head. See, the golden ratio is in nature is never exactly 1.618033. It never is. It, it, there's always slight variances of that. So the when you understand that my numbers have tolerance in in one thirty nine might be one forty four, it depends on your start date whether you start at December twenty okay. fifth or January seventh. I did calculations with both, and today they're both interesting. You know, I I can't say that I've resolved both of them, and then when you come forward to my UFO chart, 
because I'm going to answer your question in a minute of the, about the planets and and where are all the UFOs coming from? Why is it that every five years after 1917, why is it? I'm just looking for my UFO algorithm, and and I didn't get to show this much last time because then when you get to Stephenville, you're going to understand what really happened in Texas that day. You see, why every five years? Okay, 1917. Plus five years is 1922. Couldn't find anything in the historical record. Plus five years is 1927. Plus five years is 1932. The famous UFO crash in 1933 in Italy was reported in Popular Mechanics. Plus five years is the beginning of the, the Nazi bell was 1937 in Germany. Plus five years is the Battle of 42 over Los Angeles where 1,400 rounds, plus five years is Roswell and Maury Island and Kenner Arnold all in 1947. That's in the five-year algorithm. Plus five years, the UFOs over the U.S. Capitol and July 12th to the 29th. Now, what's interesting about that is we're only months away from the detonation of the first H-bomb, which was in early November of 1952. Plus five years, we're at the, the level in Texas, 200-foot-long egg-shaped UFOs over Texas. That's the level in Texas. Plus five years, we're, we're just off by less than a year for Betty and Barney Hill. Plus five years, 1967, Shag Harbor, very famous. Plus five years, the McCord uh, UFO encounter, very famous. Plus five years... Okay, now I'm going to slow you down here. So... When you're saying this at a five year intervals, yeah, what are you trying to make of that? Well, I'm I'm looking for an algorithm that remember because you're you're trying to find dates, just like you were saying about NASA. I've got to get this right down to the day. I right. you know about that guy who who made a grid and said UFOs are on a grid. They come in totally on the grid, right? You know that guy? Uh, I can't. I don't. If, unless you name him, I don't know. Uh, um, well, he he was in like somewhere like New Zealand or something, and he he's oh, I know very that famous. That, that, I know exactly. And Jimmy, Jimmy, you know that guy. Wish I could remember his name. Right he now. said there was a grid. He studied at studied it, and some people really agree with him um, that UFOs only come in on these grid points. Right. We were talking him and I just before he died, actually. Wow. Yeah, I'll have to pull up his name. So plus five years coming forward all the way to the Phoenix Lights, 1997, is in the five-year algorithm. But see, it's again, possible. you know what that suggests? A doorway. Right. I, again, I got to get this down to the day and map it to my planets. Right. When we get to, we get to Stephenville, which is... Again, the first sighting is 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 around Christmas Day. They won't give you the date. They just say two weeks before Stephenville. And Stephenville is January the 8th. And it's in the five-year algorithm. And it's in the five-year algorithm. Because the first sighting is the end of is 2007. Right? And, and I showed on my graph when you correct the calendar, right, January 7th, is where the Christ Mass day would line up today, and we're almost at the 8th. And again, that's his anointing, his baptism, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, not his physical birthday. So that's a very cosmic date. So why would we get two UFO sightings on both dates? Okay, but I want to back you up a tiny bit. When you say his anointing and when the Holy Spirit came into him or whatever, so... Why are you saying who 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 verifies that? It's one well, of the apostles. I'll tell you one thing. I mean, when I, I've been meditating every day for forty five years, I had the same so experience, have I. experience of this enormous halo of bliss that comes over you and just lifts you up out of the human state of pleasure and pain, basically that is so, so bright and so full of supernatural qualities. That's the only thing that I can personally attest to. But that's, again, the way it's written in Scripture. Here. So I, I can't say that. I know, but I'm, well, I have a reason for asking, because what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to point to, again, is that 
the idea of an illumination, you have to think about what is that? You know, it's kind of goes along with the, if a tree falls in the forest, but no one hears it. The idea is that you have a witness to the light or, you know, what the light is always symbolizing God or, you know, illumination, enlightenment, in essence, what I say is the whole reason for this game we play. But nonetheless, so if you look at it from the point of view, what you're saying is in the Bible, somebody says the whatever came down upon him and he was illuminated that day, right? He wasn't illuminated the day he was born. He was, that's the day someone witnessed it. So that's an external, uh, what you might call a verification from an external a witness. It it's, has to have a witness, right? That's what really that is, is saying, communication. Yeah. Okay, right. that's communication. So I, I would su suggest that all of these dates you're talking about and all of these where, where UFOs become visible in our environment, these are, again, sort of illuminated days, days in which they come through the veil, they become manifest to our eyes. Okay. So that's what you're really talking about. To be illuminated is to be, to be, you know, to shine with light in essence, or to and fill your mind light. also suddenly sees and can see again, let's go back for a second before I go forward on this calendar of of the, the appearance of the planet being the star of Bethlehem 139 and his crucifixion, what obliterated the sun in the three hours of darkness, yeah, was the same planet, would mean his life was designed kind of like a hologram, that he had to be on that cross at that time for that planet 139 to come by and produce the shadow. And he knew it. But it's not written anywhere. Because but it's an analogy. Think of it this way. The cross is also the light and the dark. Right. And he's born at the point in the middle, right? The, where they say he's the road. at the point in the middle. Yeah, he's. But that date for that planet. To, it's where the light and the dark again meet. We're again at that middle point, right? Which is, which is, which is an eclipse, which is the light mm, and the dark. Right. Point. Right. The meeting. So this and meeting point is also a vortex. It's also a door. And it has to be someone would have had Jesus. Would, see, you know, there was a manuscript discovered in a cave. It was called the Gospel of Judas. And in the Gospel of Judas, he's not a betrayer. Jesus tells him, go turn me in because I have to be crucified on this day. Because it has to happen then because... The fulfillment is the 33 years. And I demonstrated the two Fatimas. But in a sense, it's like a primer. It's 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 like a primer for understanding, you know, um, sort of Jesus is the the model life, right? So he has to go through these stages. And so this is the model for humanity. And it's also Just saying. planet. When it's it, a lot of ways it's form. built for children. It's it's so you know it's it's a story for children. So it's it's like showing you the process through which you're going to go in a sense. Right. We are all so fragile in the sense that the Romans could control which religions get to exist in the empire which don't but that's why they call it an analogy or a parable i mean so yes all these things have to happen within these certain dates because it symbolizes the thing okay right. so when something is a symbol of something it indicates that reality so just saying it's it's it, you know you can take it literally if you want to but and you can even say it was literal, but we are, in other words, we are, we are here and not here. Everything. This is the thing people don't realize is that we are also interdimensional. So we are here and not here. And scientists even say, you know, we blink in and out of this reality constantly. We do because our, our, they're called the, um, what do they call them? The, the, the quarks, the strange quark, which is, has an enormous amount of mass. And this is Murray Gelman, who discovered strange quarks. And I got to meet him a number of times. Hilarious guy, great sense of humor. Your strange quarks are leaving you and coming back randomly with no mathematical formula to calculate when they leave and they come back. So that means a considerable amount of your mass is coming and going. 
which and where does it go? Nobody knows where the strange corpse go. <laughs> I know, it. but let me say that he yeah. he just because he didn't figure it out mathematically doesn't mean there's not a mathematical right. You're right. Side. Sophisticated order is is very difficult to so again on my um, algorithm. Five years after the Phoenix Lights, 2002, five years later, Chicago O'Hare is at the end of the year, November 7th. So it, 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 it fits barely in my algorithm. It's, it's a tad out. Stephenville fits the first sighting. The second sighting is the beginning of the new year. And then five more years is the end of the Mayan calendar, 2020. Well, again, what is a sighting? It's a seeing of light. Right. Right? Well, and again, it's illumination. Is. Everything we see is photons telling us this is real and that's not real. So we can't see planet 139, but yet I'm saying we did at least twice. And again, you could probably chart when it's visible and when it's not. You could probably. Yeah, chart and that's that. what we're working on next. I do have somebody with the right software who will do a preliminary mapping because if these antimatter planets in their equilibrium between matter and antimatter pop in once in a while and then pop out, do you know that electrons in orbits around the nucleus of an atom, the proton and the neutron, do the same thing? Oh, they really? just disappear and reappear. Right. Okay. So there is another documented analogy for what's happening. Right. So we say... Well, they can do that at the quantum level, but we've never seen a whole planet do this. Did you know the size of Mercury? I also did a calculation on Mercury starting in January 7th, and I got another amazing number. But do you know Mercury is sizable to some of Jupiter and Saturn's moons? And I wonder if they do this. I mean, it may take thousands. I don't know the period of when this will occur. But I, I just wonder why they're so similar looking, Mercury and some of the moons of the two, you know, the, the two big, big planets with the rings, Jupiter and Saturn. Can they do this quantum exchange just all of a sudden? Remember when I told you about there's this story in Ireland about this this island that comes right. up above the ocean in near Ireland and then and it comes, it disappears, and then it shows up in the exact opposite place over by Japan or something like that. Right. If you go around the earth right to the bottom, right? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting, this idea yeah. that maybe the planets also all come, flicker in and flicker out. Maybe we, in other words, maybe we can't detect that necessarily, but so not... Not that 139 is so unique in that way, but maybe it's the whole, everything is like that. Well, we know Vulcan actually most likely. See, when a scientist throws away data, when you say, okay, this is not a sunspot, it had an orbit of just a hair under 20 days, and then we couldn't see it anymore. You don't throw that and go, oh, I was hallucinating in my telescope when three other astronomers saw the same thing and they knew they weren't sunspots. <laughs> right. So... But because we can't see it anymore, we say, well, we throw it out and they blamed it on gravitational anomalies in the sun. But where did the name Vulcan come from? It's a, the Greek and the Roman. Remember, so Zeus is Jupiter to the Romans. Hephaestus and Vulcan are the same god, the god of the forging or the melting of steel or metals. So that's where the name comes from. But the attributes, what interests me about him being chosen as the melter of metals is you can't melt metal on Mercury's temperature today. But theoretically, Vulcan is so much closer to the sun, you could. If, if we knew the temperature on Vulcan, you could absolutely melt metal. So I, I, that's where myth and reality kind of blend. But that, that I'm always interested in how reality becomes myth and myth becomes proven reality eventually again we know these uap ufos are coming in and out i actually map them i map all their latin longs because i'm looking for the same pattern right I'm, I'm looking for that you know we can see that 
there there are dates in this five year year algorithm. So every five years on Earth, what will one thirty nine do? Well, I'll tell you, one thirty nine will orbit thirteen times, and Earth will orbit the Sun five times. They're both Fibonacci numbers. His Fibonacci numbers are zero zero one two three five three five eight thirteen, right? So 13 and five are both Fibonacci numbers, and that's not surprising because they're golden ratio orbits. So that's as far as I've got on that. So so why every five years, approximately, you can be off by a sliver? Well, maybe it's a link to the number five, and what does it mean? In other words, there's something, I'm just looking it up right now. See, Vulcan is actually, in, they call it the god of fire. Now that's interesting from an Illuminati philosophy standpoint because the god of fire is um see we are the way they look at it is that we are uh, purified through fire okay so there's some and and as you said it's the sm the smelting of the metals making the metals yeah the god of face is and in is the melter of metal which is the same god as vulcan there it's just two different names right so this vulcan. is actually you know very interesting because you have to go through fire to come basically to be purified to come out the other side to be like i guess um in essence you reach enlightenment by going through fire and fire can be symbolized also by strife and and by two things opposites coming together and um battling war for example right. yeah. and so when you they merge it, you get fire and that's the same the male and female sexuality all that kind of thing so you're talking about fire is is like the creative impulse that forges you into a being you know into some kind of different kind of being it changes you so it's it's also that the the motivator of the change is through fire and of course the illuminati whenever they do anything on earth they want to make they want to use fire as part of that process right so they create fires and all that you know well, behind a being just said that Jesus would baptize you with fire and that John would baptize you with water. So and fire, by the way, also symbolizes spirit. Right. So just saying, these are and the... Light. It, it was an early metaphor for light because they didn't have light bulbs, so they didn't call it light. Right. They called it fire. That's right. So and But Prometheus, again, it also may symbolize illumination. Right. And Prometheus brings fire down from the heavens to, to humankind and gets in trouble for it. You know, see, I, I look at the names like Jupiter, Zeus, and I I look at, again, why does the word heaven in, in Greek mean Uranus? The planet Uranus didn't exist yet. It wasn't even known in antiquity. So it eventually gets the name Uranus, which becomes Uranus instead of Uranus. But we, 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 we changed the word Uranus, the name of a god who cohabited with Gaia to create the gods and eventually the human race and we change that to the word heaven as some ab ab abject word abject meaning we don't really know what heaven is because we're just calling it heaven above something high but when again when you go to your greek in the references to stars and planets they share a common word astere astere and um uh, uh, and and they're there are different interpretations of the root words for the fixed stars and the non-fixed stars, right? Which are the, the planets versus the stars in the background, right? The planets moving and, and, and the fixed stars. Uh, it, it's, it's, it means that when people read the Bible, they're reading it in English, which wouldn't exist for 500 years. And they, they're not checking the Greek on certain key points to know what does heaven really mean? It yeah, really no, I think means, that's a good point. It means a body of planets that are that are maintained by demi or gods or goddesses or whatever you want to call it. But the, the female aspect was stripped by the Roman. The Romans conquered the first church. They conquered it. It was James. And James didn't use the Gospels other than Matthew, and he used the Torah. And then he was stoned and, and thrown from the top of the temple and stoned to death. And then 
came um, then came who became Peter, which is Simon Barjona, and then they they crucified him upside down. And then it said by Hippolytus that it was then transferred to Mary Magdalene. And of course, Christians don't like that that the that the power of the church was transferred to her. So they got that out of there magically because they don't want women being rulers because the Roman Empire was ruled by men who were representation of Zeus and his his armies, basically. So they, they didn't want women in this new religion and they destroyed all of the women. The the amazing story of Thecla of Iconium and the in the Acts of Paul and Thecla and Vibia Perpetua. The early Christian women were so powerful in their illumination, they were immortal. The attempts to kill Thecla all failed. She wouldn't burn. They couldn't electrocute her with electric eels. They couldn't run spears through her body. The lions would lay down and lick her feet and they wouldn't touch her. So she's so powerful, Thecla, in the Acts of Paul and Thecla, they just take it out and they say, oh, that's heresy. So today, a common Western Christian, ha if you show them the Acts of Paul and Thecla, they won't even read it. They've been completely subdued by the Romans, which is the Roman Catholic Church. And then the Roman Catholic Church breeds all these pedophiles who are devastating our children, and they still worship them. It's just freaking incredible. It's incredible. How they got away with it. I mean, it, it's 2,000 years of brainwashing, yet those manuscripts exist. They emerged, and the Vatican calls them heresy. The third secret of Fatima proved that Satan was in the Vatican, inside, which really is what, what God was really trying to say through the third secret, was then distorted a whole document because John Paul gets an assassination attempt May 13th. May 13th is the first day the mother appeared to the three children in Fatima, Portugal. It's day one. But the it's day also day. an Illuminati date. Is that the day when, um, I when forget. When John Paul was, was shot. Yeah. No, but it's also in their history as a special day, like when they, when they're, well, you're really created. close to the ascension date of Jesus, which again, because they're on lunar calendar, May 13th would probably be the true ascension date, which is which is 40 days after the true Easter. So, so again, when you're at mid-May, you're at ascension period, and ascension period lines up with, May 13th lines up with one orbit of 139, by the way, if that's one orbit. So John Paul is shot on May 13th. He survives. He buries the third secret and he makes it look like the third secret is Satan trying to kill him. But when you watch Vatican Girl on Netflix, you're gonna if you if you really have the courage to watch it, people, you're gonna see how bad it is in there. It, 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 Wait, it, it, watch it, what? What are you talking about? Watch what? Well, Vatican Girl. It's it's a it's a six-part documentary about how the Vatican, on Vatican grounds, abduct um, the um, Emanuela Orlandi for sacrifice, and it goes all the way up to the John Paul, and it goes all the way up to Pope Francis, and the family is looking for her body, and they find out there are numerous girls that are taken by the Vatican for these satanic rituals, I will call them, because they are, and... Did you know that, uh, sh I'm just looking this up, the number 13 is also uh, re represents Shiva. And you know how Shiva is, is at the gates of CERN. Right, I do. I do know that. And also Shiva is at the site of Trinity. Um, and how Oppenheimer wrote, I become destroyer of worlds because Shiva is known as the destroyer. But so you, you see, again, the Buddha's birth date lines up to mid-May also. So again, I, I don't believe, I don't honestly believe you can own, no, everyone wants to own a religion. Like a fundamentalist Christian wants to own Christianity and oppose this church and oppose that church and say, if you believe this, you're going to hell. So they use fear tactics to bring their sheep in and say, then give me your money. Like the Joel Olsteins of the world, taking a $50 million salary and driving Lamborghinis and because they use fear. 
they used the same tactic that the Romans used to keep the the Catholic faith, you know, sequestered around their their umbrella. And again, all the other churches in the world are subject to how Rome controlled the release of the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas. Yes, they. There are tons of Gospels, and I've read them all, and I can see what they all share in common. Women who are illuminated, get rid of them. All maleism, which yeah, for sure. led to perversion, led to pedophilias, that led to the mass of pedophilia. And I'm, I mean, I'm a father of two young daughters. Believe me, I'm, I'm all over this. <clears throat> I, I want to protect my daughters. So by getting rid of the marriage... Again, in the Urantia book, Jesus is married with children, by the way. I don't sure. I haven't read the Urantia book. I just kind of got interested in it because <laughs> it shared the same birthday as me. And I thought, well, what does that mean? Oh. Uh, well, I, I, there, you know, there is some discussion that there's the Urantia book is limited. It has some good stuff. I've read some of it. I don't know if I've read all of it a long yeah. time ago. But anyway, um, yeah, you know, that it's like a lot of things though. Um it's kind of like the raw, what do they call it? The raw yeah, material, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, but I, I got to the, to the edge of the raw material and I found that they were hiding a hell of a sh lot. So that just, you know, really pissed me off. <laughs> well, they always so, have to hide because the elite at the top want to feel special that they know the highest secret. Right. And to say that, that Jesus would have known he had to die at that date at that time. It all had to be more planned like it is in the gospel of Judas than it is in the traditional gospels. And the traditional gospels didn't arrive for over. Yeah, but you really years. have to look at the Nag Hammadi texts as well, because there's yeah. so much lies. And then you also have to get into the Essenes and they seem the pretty Q. hidden as well. The Essenes, I, I, you know, I eventually I read all of it and then I reread as I get older because I'll have newer and newer insights. But wh which makes the story that we've done for two sessions now. It's my wife who started this, who who gave me these two numbers, Venus and 591. And, and the golden ratio solves a, an enormous puzzle and ultimately gives me the proof that I need as a man, as her you know, former husband, that she's out there. She didn't, she's, it's, it's way bigger than going through a tunnel of light and seeing deceased loved ones. It's way bigger than that. Whether those points are planets or portals to a higher, each of those points being a doorway to a higher universe, I don't know, but something happens on the alignment of it when you calculate the orbits of those positions and okay, do you know who Rima Lebao is? No. Okay, well, she she was married to Stubblebean, who was the one who created the uh, remote viewers. Well, he was the general in charge of the remote viewers, I guess you might oh, say. Oh, oh. General Stubblebean, you can look him up, or Stubblebean, however you say his name. He's not alive anymore, but Rima, okay, was... I guess she was married to him, I think. And what happens is I did an interview recently with her. Mm -hmm. And I probably are, I'm saying her, her last name wrong, but Lebo, L-A-I-B-O, or Lebo or something. Lebo, I guess it is. And L-A-I-B-O-W. The reason I bring her up is, so she had this magical meeting with, she considers him like her soulmate or her twin flame, whatever. And she saw him across an airport, never spoke to him, didn't even know him from Adam, so to speak, and ran across and just jumped into his arms. And then they were married and everything. And then he eventually got killed by the deep state. So what I, the reason I'm bringing her up is because she then, when he, they killed him, she got in community. She first used psychics and various people to communicate with him. And they were getting some good stuff and a lot of their overlay kept coming in. So then she decided to do it herself. And eventually she managed to connect with him. And she's been downloading books of information that are way beyond her capacity because he was a physicist or something. And, um, 
and and she'd been di- dictating book books from him. So wow. she's in com- constant communication with him. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people, couples and people that want to be in, con- you know, communication with their loved ones. A lot of times they'll go through another party, but in her case, she has a very uh, unique story and she has got, you know, documented evidence that the books she's downloading from him are not, you know, are, are not her. She has no knowledge of physics and all that. See, there's, if you have a conversation with a person, we, we hear a certain amount of it. It goes through our filter. And then when we repeat it back, there, it's not the same. And, and that's how everything becomes mythic. And it's probably, it's the same with the gospels. It's probably the same with the Buddha's teachings and, 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 it's everything. well yeah because you, there's a filter but nonetheless that doesn't mean truth can't be found i mean oh no i agree no it, especially with couples it, this is what i was going to say they know each other so well that they can see past the filter better than anybody because right. you're not talking to somebody you just met you're talking to somebody that you lay next to i mean i was with my wife 18 years so so, so I know her so well. I do know that she was a absolute perfectionist to a razor blade. Our first fight in LA was about black holes and she was screaming at me at the top of the phone. <laughs> so that's how precise she was. So to give me a number like 591. It can well, be so because it's, it's so obvious because it's 19.5 that, that she was right. giving you a significant number. You know, <laughs> and maybe on the other side of the mirror, it's 19.5. Right, because if I write nineteen, right, put it in maybe, front of the but mirror. but think of it this way: maybe the number, the visible number, is nineteen point five. That's the one Hoagland talks about. He, but he says it 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 reveals on a planet some special spot that becomes significant because you can see it. Well, five nine one is the hidden; it's the hidden side of nineteen point five. So she's trying to show you the hidden world. In essence, you know that I'm trying to find this, Carrie. When she died, I got a new credit card, <laughs> and my credit card security code was 591, and that appeared before she vocalized my name at 591 days. Because, but it's a it's a manifestation on a physical level. So I actually deactivated right. that card. I have it around here somewhere. <laughs> and it's actually true. My credit card. But this is like what we call a synchronicity, right? right. So yeah. when you have a synchronicity, there, this is again, things coming together to like connect. There's a connection, right? So it's it's that in a sense that the point in the cross, the center of the cross. So this is uh, highly significant, basically. It's, it's highly significant, and and know, in we, in we that connection so... is a connection is a communication, right? We feel so alone on this planet. Like we're so, the UFOs at least make us feel we're not alone, but yet they don't really talk to many of us. Um, Being on a planet surrounded by other planets that apparently have nobody on them is quite disturbing. Like the fact that that we don't (laughs) even have a neighbor. But they do. That's actually... Yeah. In, in this in and Venus, past. I mean, you know, you, you know all about the the visitor from Venus. Uh, what's his name? Oh, yeah. Valiant Thor. Yeah, I Valiant Thor. And, well, watch I mean, this. these are real. This is real. You know, that there's this. tons of information about his visit and he how he stayed with the, you know, for the, was the guest of the president or whatever. I mean, you know, we have a very strong relationship with Venus. And Venusian. So 365.256, which is three decimals of sidereal time, minus Venus, which is 224.701, is just on just a tad above 139, right? 139.51 is only half, that they're only one day away. So inversely, Venus and 139 are. They're the only planets that do this. So 139 is the other is the leftover in a year to Venus. So I find that interesting too. I don't yeah. know exactly what what that means, but there is a ratio there. And ratios well, it could it could be the parallel of Venus, in other words. It could be the hyperdimensional other the other Venus. 
and that's interesting because Jesus declares, I am the morning star, which is Venus, but so did many other ancient goddesses and previous heads of orders declare the morning star. So why mm -hmm. are they all declaring Venus, right? Why? And maybe the hyperdimensional Venus maybe but maybe you know hoagland is very into the hyper dimension and yeah, you, we, let's come back to hoagland and then we're gonna have to close this down but okay i know it's been fabulous i mean i i think it's fabulous <laughs> what you're talking about but you know hoagland is very into hyper dimensional physics and maybe hyper dimensional i don't know a lot about what he talks about anymore but Hyperdimensional physics may be, again, getting into what we're talking about is multidimensional, but also this parallel antimatter. I'm supposed to go on his show this Sunday, but may I wonder oh. if all three of us could get together, as, if that's possible. I don't know if he wants to talk to me, to be honest. Oh, really? I invited him for an interview, but he said he'd, he'd quote unquote, look at his schedule. That's yeah. his way. You know, I know Huglin so well for many years, you know, yeah. way back in the day. You so, go way back. Yeah. You, well, you yeah. So back. I don't know, you know, why or whatever. I think maybe, you know, he he is very aligned with the Illuminati. You know, he studied all that stuff and um, he knows how to read that stuff very well. But he wants to keep their secrets. So maybe he doesn't. That's why he doesn't want to talk to me. He, he's keeping we'll some of the we'll secrets talk to him on Sunday night. We'll see. You know, okay, but yeah, no, I'd love to listen to you talk. So that'd be really fun. Um, do you know what time you're on? Uh, nine Pacific. Okay. The other side of midnight is his show. Yes, I know. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. So, right, okay, thanks, but we Harry. were talking about, we were going to come back to 19.5 at the end of, of this show remember where you were going to say something about what hoagland and you talked about because you guys were talking you said last night we talked last night briefly to plan the show for this sunday night with him so did he say anything because i wanted to ask you about the moon the glass structures yeah. because i had this i was writing a screenplay years before i met hoagland and I remote viewed the moon as part of my screenplay and actually described these beings manifesting this, these glass structures in my screenplay. And I have it documented I, the year I wrote the screenplay. You know that bulletproof glass is aluminum glass, which is, which is very hard to destruct. So it would be a type of glass that would be so strong if you could build buildings out of aluminum glass then or domes they would withstand enormous abuse um so he you know he's really hot on the trail of this and he's showing you know photographs i don't, you probably saw him right right oh, yeah. during the eclipse and he was showing how the I guess he was trying to say that maybe the eclipse also illuminated the fact that there was these glass structures on the moon, but he's also saying this recent, what Odysseus voyage to the moon has also brought back photographs that show these glass structures. Well, the, yeah, th that mission had the worst camera. Oh my God. When, like when you think of the camera, I mean, this is the new iPhone 15 pro max and you think of Hasselblad, and you, when I looked at the pictures from that mission, the test mission to the moon, they used the worst camera on but purpose. But it's, no, they probably, you know, they, they dumbed down the photos. You know, NASA's been doing that forever. Yeah, that's right. They could have done that too. They could have dumbed down the photos. They're not they that stupid, really, seriously. Huh. They're always messing with our heads. It's yeah. just like saying, you know, that, um, you know, we went to the oh. moon, but we, it's fake. Well, we did both. It's both. People, you Jerry, know, you people brought up last time that the weather, most people were looking at the eclipse through the weather. And this one guy beneath me in Montana, Masua, posted a picture. All right. I can show you, I can show this, you know, on, on the internet. I wonder, maybe I saw that picture. And I'll show you the picture because I can go to his Facebook live, which is All right. you know, perfectly fine. He's getting a lot of flack for this, but then other people are posting the same image. Okay, let me sh let me show you this. This guy, um, 
here it is. Here's his name and everything. So people can go to his site. And this is what, now I've got something similar in my photos right above him. So you see, theoretically, the black circle That's is the great. moon. Then you have the sun. And then you have this other round bright spot above. And if you think about the angle of where the sun is, there's a number of possibilities that might explain this. But this, more and more people on this guy, on his wall, it, are getting similar images through the clouds. That's um, great. And again, did was the weather engineered where most people did not see a clear sky? They are looking at it through the clouds. It I has to be. Know. It has to be. Why? Because the secret space program, CERN and NASA, they're all utilizing it to do something. And they certainly don't want you to see what they're doing, right? So they're going to occult it to a certain degree. So the question is, is what are they using the doorway for? And, you know, I told you, I think we talked about this on my last show with you, Richard, um, Richard, um, Alan Miller, a physicist who talked about, he's, he works for Navy intelligence. He said what he was allowed to say, basically, which is that he thinks that NASA was shooting those three rockets at the Van Allen belt. And for a reason to, and then we, he wouldn't say what the re, real re reason was like, they were trying to say, Oh, they were collecting data from, from you know, sending some rocket to, to collect data or something stupid. But the reality is that they were doing something for sure. And there's three, well, there's again, a triangle. In the, there's antimatter in the Van Allen belts. And that's yeah. And we talked about that. And there's, uh, he also talked, yeah, about this. It, it's, um, I have it written down this word that has to do with crystal, crystallization. Um, it's this mycelium, mycelium, something like that. You know what I mean? I have it written down. Hmm. Anyway, it's it's a very interesting dynamic. And of course, they're not going to show you what they got, even if whatever they did was successful. We won't know. Well, now, never. Hoagland, because he is a red in member of their club, might actually know what they were doing. So this would be great. Could you raise this with Hoagland when you talk to oh. him on Sunday night? Because... That is, um, I would like to see him try to sidestep that question. <laughs> well, type type it out for me and then exactly All right. on it and email yeah, it to me. I will. And I'll bring it up on Sunday night. He, by the way, he watched our whole last presentation and so did his assistant. Oh, where we, our last interview? Yeah, our last one, part one. Yeah. He, him oh, good. Assistant. Well, I hope, I thing. hope he's going to watch this and, you know, I loved his wife, Robin. She was just a fabulous oh, yeah, person. And um, we had a lovely, you know, meeting one time at one of my conferences and stuff. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so it's lovely to have you here, David, as always. Thank you so much for being on my show. Um, this is ongoing. This has got to be an ongoing investigation. It's yeah? got to be ongoing. And when my film comes out, you know, it, it will visually pre present everything really clear. Because some people, you know, you can tell them about an orbit of a planet and they just can't see it in their mind's eye. Right. So I'm hoping the film will come out by somewhere around next Christmas or early into next new year. Okay. I mean, producing things in high quality. But people. you might get more information before that. I know. Because this idea is so good. This I idea know. of the hidden planets, because there is document, there's other, you know, information out there that they are saying more and more there is hidden planets we don't even know are there in our solar well, system. Well, this is another funny thing. Far more. In, in the Urantia, there's a video on YouTube. Urantia says... There's 12 planets in our solar system, but we only have eight right now. So where's the other four? And the video where the guy is narrating is kind of saying, well, are they the dwarf planets? And so again, it was channeled material, the Arantia, in, in Chicago in the 1920s. And guess when the book is published? October <laughs> the 13th, 1955. So there's that hmm. date again, right? The, which is the Fatima date. So anyway, we'll, we'll go into that. Again, I don't know a lot about Narantia, but I just find the coincidences to it very fascinating. 
Um, so maybe I'll, I'll get more answers. We'll probably do a part three, you know, before. Okay. All right. Thanks for your time today, Carrie. Thank you. As always, great to see you. Take care. All right. You too. Take care. Okay. Thanks everyone for watching. Bye-bye.